Let me get right into this here and share the screen. But before I do that, can you all see me? Am I featured here? Yes, no? Good to see you still have a shop. I don't. That's a shop at Notre Dame. Cool. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, my shirt. Edu I like it. is important, but woodworking is importanter. Okay, can y'all see that? So um, this is my email address down below here. And if you want to contact me, um, I suggest you write that down. I'll be happy to answer any further questions you might have after this session is over. This is a photograph of one of my classes and I was at Camp Lindo for 16 years and in that time I took a, a group photograph of every class I ever taught like this. Um, I would use it at back to school nights so parents loved it. So as it says here, form in search of the best practices, I used to do this presentation at conferences and get feedback from uh, other teachers and incorporate that into this presentation. So this presentation is a compilation of not only things that I developed and my ideas, but other teachers' ideas as well. I like to start with a little humor. I'm a very big fan of um, Larson. So uh, this one might be considered a little sexist, but I thought it was funny. Good working humor. So this is one of my favorite quotes from a scientist, and I really believe in science. Working with your hands can flood your brain with nat natural antidepressants. I used to use this a lot when I would talk to parents. And then also, and remember, if the women can't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. This is from Red Green, Canadian philosopher, I call him. Uh, this is from his, his show, The Red Green Show. If you haven't heard of it and haven't seen it, I suggest you take a look at, uh, do a search on YouTube for Red Green and take a look at a couple of, of the um, episodes of his show. It's a brand of humor that not everybody finds especially amusing, but I find it be quite amusing. So, safety. Um, when power equipment is involved, safety should be the top priority. There will always be a better, safer way to do things. And I think as an example of, of that, actually technology-wise, is the saw stop. Uh, keep records of the safety lessons given and the student safety tests taken. I keep all of those things for about four years. I used to keep them about four years. Um, Every t for the entire time a student was with me. Get a signed parent waiver uh, explaining exactly what's going to be done in the class, what piece of pieces of equipment are going to be used. If they have any problem with any of those, they can check it and say, I don't want my, 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 uh, my child to be using it. And um, I'll get more into this a bit later, also medications that they might be taking. Take all the time necessary to complete the safety lessons to your satisfaction. In my 21 years of teaching, I only had, I have had, I had no, that is zero major uh, injuries, a lot of Band-Aid injuries, but that's about it. I have a good safety manual. You're welcome to use what I developed if you want and change it if you want, but it's a meticulous, um, meticulously crafted safety manual that took several years of, of um, uh, reiterations to uh, make it what it is now. And QR codes and safety videos, I'll talk about that later. This is what I decided were the components of safety. There's the environment of your shop. There's student behavior, your equipment, training, your diligence and awareness, first aid and readiness, and what kind of leverage do you have over all of these things? So we'll start with environment. Lighting obviously is important. 
You need to be able to see well in order to do things properly and safely. Uh, hearing protection, the decibel level. You all know about um, what decibel levels are and um, how it functions. It's a matter of noise over time. Um, I would uh, take a decibel meter and go around the shop with all of the equipment running and take readings just to see what it was. And usually it was, it was appropriate. It wasn't anything that was gonna be harmful. Sometimes when a piece of maple was going through the, my old planer, uh, it would really scream and that would kind of tip it over. Uh, but that wasn't always, and there wasn't enough of that happening to make it a problem. Um, getting a decibel meter is very simple these days. You download an app. Um, eye protection, I used to give each student a pair and then if they lost it, I would charge them $3 for a new one. Um, and I would have a sheet that I would hand out to them that would say, as much as I admire Stevie, Stevie Wonder, Helen Keller, etc., I do not wish to go through the rest of my life blinded. And I would have them write that out several times, times on that sheet, just as a help, help them to remember. And it's always a struggle. I had signs everywhere, eye protection required, um, but uh, sometimes they forget, sometimes they are a bit rebellious, and sometimes my goal was to have them walk out of the shop wearing them because that means they were comfortable enough to um, keep them on when they left. Uh, dust collection is important, of course, and I put one of these things at various, uh, this is a remote that turned on the dust collector, at various machines around the shop. So whenever you went and used that machine, you could turn on a dust collector right there at that point, that point of use. Uh, air cleaning, I had an air, cleaning ha air cleaner hanging from the ceiling with filters that helped. Uh, sanding table, this is something that was very, very efficient in the classroom. It was a pine box that had a um, pegboard, quarter inch hole pegboard on the top and it was connected, as you can see, with the pipe in the back to the dust collecting system. And all sanding was done there. All sanding dust went down into that box and up into the dust collecting system. It was very, very effective. Fire protection, obviously, you need to have extinguishers around and um, keep them accessible. Let the students know where they are. Uh, covered metal container for oily rags. Finishes that we used were uh, Danish oil and um, um, polyurethane gel, uh, and uh, those are, can be a problem if the rags are piled up someplace. So that's, there was a metal container right there for their use to put them in to keep oxygen from getting at the uh, exothermic reaction taking place in there. Cleaning the shop was essential. I would have them do that after every, um, every class session. Um, put everything away, clean up the bench tops, and sweep the floors. The floors should be kept clean and uh, free from any debris, any hazards. Finish room also needs to be kept clean. Uh, if you have a spray booth, make sure the exhaust fan is working. Um, I never let, I, I let a few of my students do some spraying with lacquer, uh, but mostly, mostly they did not. Uh, I did any lacquer spraying that they wanted and um, with a very efficient spray booth. Student behavior. <clears throat> so I have behavior rules. The basic behavior rules are up in the front of the class, which is no throwing of objects, no running, no horseplay, no loud noises, no unseemly language, and one voice, which means only one person speaking at a time when there's a lesson being given. Um, I gave them a sheet of general safety rules, which we went over, and I would have them uh, um, sign it when it was when it was done, and keep get, and turn it into me that that um, expressed they were uh, they they were uh, exposed to this and they understood it all uh, and they were going to abide by it. I use a, a coach's whistle, just a plastic coach's whistle, when I needed to get their attention because it can be awfully noisy, and um, a whistle is a very effective way to cut through that noise and get their attention. They, they would stop what they were doing and look at me whenever I blew that whistle. Signed copy, as I said. And another uh, handout I gave them was <clears throat> shop skills for management issues. Putting things back especially was what it was and making sure things stay clean. And the parent authorization form I would give them had um, safety information, as I mentioned earlier, the machines that they would be using and um, 
I was concerned about students who would come in on their ADHD medication or whatever, that they would be safe and um, they would have all their, their, their cognitive facilities in, in, in working order and their motor facilities in working order. Uh, and if there were any issues with that, we would have to uh, discuss that and how we would deal with it. Equipment, is it safe? Is it up to date? One way to deal with that is to utilize your Perkins funds. If you don't know what Perkins funds are, you should um, well, I'll look it up. Um, by the way, um, you can find information on that on the, on the CITEA.org website. And um, you can find a lot of information there, including some of the safety videos I'll talk about later. Um, Perkins funds are, are, are a federal funding source that's given to school districts and it is for uh, career technical education. So you should be getting Perkins funds if you have uh, that kind of, if you're teaching CTE or ITE classes. And I did a lot of updating of equipment uh, with Perkins funds. As a matter of fact, when I started at that shop at Campo Lindo, it was a state-of-the-art 1963 shop. When I left, it was a state-of-the-art 2016 shop. Maintenance is obviously very important. And the districts have different ways of dealing with maintenance. My district was very happy to let me do the maintenance on the machines. I was fortunate enough to have spent 20 years in industry prior to that, uh, running my own business, designing and making furniture and, and cabinetry. Uh, so I knew how to maintain the equipment. But I understand that when you can't do it yourself, um, you have this, if you have the district do it, sometimes it's going to take weeks before they get to it. And that can be a real issue. Uh, one of these days, I'll do a class on maintenance. Sharp, safe, dull, dangerous. Make them, make them aware of what that means. Dull tools can be dangerous. Sharp tools are safer because they function the way they're supposed to, shape, to, to function. Guards on your machinery. So most machines come with guards, and guards are very important. Um, I would always remove the table saw guard blade guard for small rips because there are situations where the safeguard is more of a hazard than it is, this is my opinion anyway, than it is a, a help. So um, that's something to keep in mind. I put signs on the machines to remind students 12 inches minimum length for a piece of wood to be ripped and on the top it gives further information. Table saw minimum size was 12 inches long, one and a half inches wide was the max, the minimum size, the maximum size, no, minimum size I would allow them to, to rip. Um, cross cut eight inches long using either a miter gauge or a cross cut fence. Safety aids, push sticks and push blocks, jigs, the sliding table. So this is the first sliding table I got, um, <clears throat> which is very, very useful for doing um, cross cutting very accurate for doing cross cutting, especially if you're doing a sizable plywood panels. Um, this was the one that I had when I had unisaws and I replaced that with a, another one, as you'll see later, um, onto my um, saw stops. Lockout tag out is something that's important to do if you're doing machinery maintenance and you've got the machine partially taken apart and it's not very especially obvious that you do, the, um, uh, the, the machine should be, should be um, disabled, unplugged, um, and unable to be replugged in, uh, whatever, so, and with a sign on it saying this is locked out, this is, should not be used. Because sometimes maintenance people would come in and want to use my equipment, and they didn't know what state it was at. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> I don't know what this blank one is. Is that blank to everybody? Well, anyway, so this is the, oh, I heard something there. What was that? I can't hear you. That first one is blank. Yeah, I know what it is. What Thank you. Um, this is a Jessam sliding table, and this was an awesome piece of equipment. It did not have a leg to hold out, hold, the, hold it uh, up uh, away from the, uh, a support leg to, to keep it level. Uh, in this one, I like the clearance of that. And also, um, it had a great set of bearings on it. It allowed you to cut up to, I think, a 36 inch wide uh, cross cut. And um, it was extremely accurate. Uh, problem is, I don't know that it's still being made. 
but I highly recommend it if you can find it. Training. Basic philosophy, keep fingers out of harm's way. So everything should be set up to keep their hands away from the business end of a machine. And I would say four inches minimum. And we'll see some examples of that as we go along. Attitude is important. <clears throat> now, these are just kids and they come in here and they've, um, maybe they're experimenting, um, maybe they're on medications, uh, maybe they've stayed up all night, previous night, studying for that Shakespeare test and uh, they don't have full control of their functions. I would allow them that. I would allow them to come to me and say, I don't feel like using any equipment today. I don't feel safe. Fine, don't. If there's anything I can do to help with that, I'd be glad to do it. Maybe another student can help you, whatever. But um, I wanted them to be safe at all times. Um, sometimes a kid would come to me and his eyes were really red and I would say, looks like you're having some serious allergy problems. Maybe you should go see the school nurse. Medications were dealt with on that term. A parent authorization form I mentioned earlier. Paying attention. Of course, they're easily distracted, but I had to be very diligent about keeping them paying, keeping their attention uh, and making sure they were, they were getting the lessons that they needed. Um, knowledge and equipment familiarity. This is really key. Um, safety rules, a safety manual I'll, I'll show you later. Um, general safety rules and information are in that, in that manual. Potential hazards and how to mitigate those hazards is the way I set it up. And um, machine safety protocols and safety rules. Um, so the most safety manuals I looked at in, in compiling this one um, had mixed in with safety rules, various other things that really didn't involve safety, that safety, they were just methods of work. So I separated those out and uh, put them in a different category. Finishes, toxic substances, MSDS, material safety data sheets, um, you need to keep on hand. I tried to keep finishing simple, and one of the things I mentioned earlier, uh, a gel poly polyurethane, um, was something that I adopted because it's very difficult to spill. If the can gets knocked over, it doesn't go spilling out. And that had been a problem with some of the other more liquidy finishes. Uh, they would do that with, with um, I would give them um, nitrile gloves, latex people, some people have allergies to. Uh, whenever they were gonna go do some finishing, make sure they wear their safety glasses and put on a, a, um, a garment one of my old lab coats that was up there to protect their clothing when they did finishing. Videos and DVDs, I had a comp compilation of those that I would use to show them uh, various things about safety. And um, I ended up making uh, my own series of videos about each of the machines in the shop, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. Skills and work habits. Of course, you have to develop good skills and work habits in order to be safe. I would do demonstrations of those skills and work habits and. They should be all, all, they would be required to all be paying attention, very close attention. And then I would do what I call controlled practice. Each student would be given a checklist that I would sign them off on if they've completed uh, their um, safety presentation to me on how to safely operate the machine. So every student showed me that they knew how to safely operate the, the table saw, the jointer, the sliding compound miter saw, and uh, probably a couple others, um, and I would check them off once they did. But I was very, very strict about having them um, show me, demonstrate to me in front of my eyes that they were able to do it. Um, testing, I gave them a safety test of 100 questions, uh, which you can, you can use if you wish. It'll be on the, on the uh, back of the safety manual. I would give them that safety test with their safety manual, so they had no excuse for not getting 100% on a safety test. Well, very rarely did anyone get 100%. So I made a passing grade 90% and any, any answers they missed, I would have them write the safety rule it pertained to 10 times, handwritten. Um, okay, diligence and awareness. So vigilance, Homeland Security's got nothing on the woodshop teacher. I never wore hearing protection uh, because I needed to be in tune to what was going on in the shop. 
you constantly are aware of all the sights, the sounds, the smells, and the feels. Sometimes you could feel something going on that is wrong because of the vibration on the floor, uh, even a concrete floor. Um, so it was like always being in tune to what's going on. A friend of mine called it the music of machines. What was that sound? Sometimes it's the sound of, a, of some sort of a kickback. <clears throat> something smells like it's burning and that something is sometimes is burning. Are you planning to cross that cross cut that using the rip fence? And I'm going to show you a good example of that uh, later on. So that to me is the most difficult ta task that a woodshop teacher faces. You have to be on, really on, the entire time the students are working in the class. The only time I would get to relax is when they were in cleanup. And even then I had to make sure they were doing it thoroughly. The other, one other component is first aid and injuries. Um, eye wash station is something that I had put in because it's really important to, to immediately treat anything that happens to the eyes um, with water. And so um, I had this eye wash station put in. There are some other types of eye wash stations that are not necessarily uh, attached to the water source like this one is. There are bottles, for example. But most things say 15 minutes rinsing. So um, um, I got one of these guys. First aid kits, every classroom had a first aid kit. I had some extra things in my first aid kit, standard items, lots of Band-Aids, which I would buy at Dollar Tree. They were inexpensive. And um, lots of kids like to use Band-Aids because they got a little something and they want to get a Band-Aid on it. That's how kids are. Tweezers to pull out splinters. Um, I bought some of these here. They're, they're disposable. Um, there are a large variety of these things at various costs. Ice packs and plastic bags. Um, in a past life, when I was running my business, um, I, was, um, I was instrumental in having a presentation to a group that uh, involved a, a replantation surgeon come and talk to us about what they did with severed digits. And from that, I learned that if a digit is severed, it should be isolated from water and that would, be, that would be ice, so it doesn't get macerated. And if it gets macerated, it's much more difficult to attach, to reattach. So I have ice packs and then Ziploc bags to put the severed item in, along with an ice pack to keep it nice and fresh for uh, the replantation process. But I never had to use any of it. Bloodborne pathogens, I'm sure, I'm sure you all deal with that in your district. That's probably state mandated at this point. You get training from the district, you probably have to pass the test every year. School nurses. Now, school nurses, we used to have a full-time one. Eventually, it went, it went down to half-time. And I know some places do not have school nurses at all. But uh, they were an ally to me in, in uh, running my program. Uh, full-time, part-time. Hopefully, you've got somebody there who's a trained medical provider um, to help out. And it wasn't always because of injuries. Mostly it used to be with uh, students who were feeling sick or I had a couple of students just pass out. Um, one time one student looked at another student's minor injury, saw the blood and just threw up and passed out. Uh, so <laughs> I told that student, I hope you don't choose a medical profession for a career. Uh, communication, I, oftentimes I would call the office because I had an issue and there would be nobody there. So I insisted on getting a walkie-talkie so I could raise somebody um, to deal with my issue uh, when needed. Again, I never had to deal with that, but it was nice to have. What kind of leverage do you have? I had a program in place where I would use a demerit system. So students would get, uh, I'd keep track of this, demerits for whatever, and it was a list of what the, what the infractions were and how many demerits they would get. So it was trying to control their behaviors and um, that included cleanup and they would get three demerits would result in, if they got three demerits, it would, would, would result into a referral to administration. And the, the administration would usually give them uh, a two day suspension. And uh, a lot of them just didn't want to be suspended from my class. Um, and then I would not hesitate to play the safety card. Um, 
if you have a student who is a hazard to himself or others, uh, they need to be out of the class. And those students occasionally show up and I would just spell that out to administration. This, this student is inappropriate to be in this class and I cannot be responsible for any injuries he causes to himself or others. And he goes bye-bye. Now, machines in the shop. One of the most hazardous machines in the shop. Well, the shaper. Not in my shop. There was one in there when I took over the shop. I got rid of it uh, the first week. Um, I call them, I refer to those things as whirling death bits. Um, it's just too much of a machine for a, a um, teenager to be using. As a matter of fact, I don't like to use them, so I won't. Also, the router table replaces that. It uses, um, it's, it's a smaller version of that, and that's much more manageable. Use feather boards and jigs to hold your work in place. And what I have here is a setup to do tongue and groove. This one here cuts the, the tongue. This one here cuts the groove. So two tables are set up like that. This is a jig to push the narrow breadboard end of the cutting board we made through that, through that um, uh, router bit um, in a safe manner. I also invested in a couple T-square fences, Craig T-square fences. They were very helpful in keeping things um, accurate, ac accurately operating. Uh, Reed and Armshaw saw was, I can't, was one in there also. It took a while to get rid of it, but it is now gone. I, took, I replaced it with a very nice Hitachi sliding compound miter saw. It had basically the same amount of cut capacity that is about uh, I don't know, 13 inches or so, that the uh, radial arm saw had, but a, a much safer way of operating it. Um, I think I'm going to be getting into your sliding compound miter saw cross-cut technique here, because this is something that used to happen quite frequently. There would be a kickback on that machine, and it, I figured out what it was, and that is that the, um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, well, let me get to that later. This is the technique that I would use to have them use that machine. So the operator would have the, the, the free hand that's not operating machine behind their back, not holding the piece of wood. So here's an illustration of it. You'll notice the piece of wood is um, held down with a, was clamped down here with a hold down and um, it's securely in place. And so the student doesn't need to um, worry about getting their hand anywhere near that blade. So the work is always clamped for every cut. And here you see an example of it. So it's a matter of getting the right kind of, of hold downs on your machines to, to uh, hold the piece of wood. This one here extended pretty nice, nicely close to where the cut was so you could have a secure uh, piece of wood right there next to the cut. So this is what I started to talk about. Kickback on a, on a um, compound miter saw. Compound miter saw has the, the um, blade moving through the wood in this direction, front to back. So as you can see, if you've got a gap back here, and this is very exaggerated, if you've got a piece of wood that's got a, a bit of a bow to it, and um, there's a gap, even a minor gap, like a quarter of an inch or less, when you're cutting through this here, and you get to the point where the wood will no longer support the kerf, then that piece of wood is going to go slamming back to the fence, and guess what's going to happen to the blade over here? It gets caught in the wood and gets kicked back toward the operator. Now, it's not that dangerous of an operation, but it scares them and it's, it's frightening and it can be violent, but the blade is not going to actually do them any injury. But there's a very simple way to deal with this, and that is to do a, um, a relief cut back here. So this is the kerf that's happening. And I would start by making a, cru a cut, a plunge cut right here at the back to eliminate this hinge. And so then, as the saw, there's a plunge cut. As the saw goes through it, there's no longer a hinge there for it to cause a, a, um, uh, a, a closing of the kerf. And this was very successful. And here's a nice picture of it. And this used to be a video, but uh, it no longer works because it can't find uh, the video. This was something that I used at school and I don't have that access to that video apparently any longer. 
but it really demonstrates making a cut right here and then starting to normally making a cut going this way. Hey, Don, in my shop, I have uh, auxiliary fences attached to the factory fence. Uh, so if you're cutting shorter pieces, it, it doesn't tend to pull the material into the opening. Mm -hmm. And the other rule I have, and I have it on the safety test, I guess it's better categorized under your techniques uh, chapter. But basically, yeah. you want your concave surface against the fence, and it should be tight against the fence where the blade passes through. Yeah. And in that way, we, we oh. largely almost completely avoid the problem you just mentioned. Right. Exactly. In fact, the binding that we experience in my shop tend to be uh, because the piece is wide and the wood is reactive. And right. just as it would on the radial arm saw, you're, as you're cutting through the material, the wood can be reactive and then it pinches the blade. And then and so, um, case hardening which is a, a um, improper um, drying of the piece of wood, and all sorts of things can happen. There are a lot of tensions in wood that is not, are not obvious, uh, and they sometimes become very obvious when you uh, start to cut it. Yeah, you can't see them. No, and you, should, you, you, you can sometimes see, you got a board, it looks nice and flat, you're put, doing a, a rip cut on it, and suddenly the off-cut part of it starts to curl up and away. Yes. They curl in. And, and start to bind on the blade. I have one board that I've kept for now, I think better than 30 years. It was before I was teaching and I was ripping a two by four in half and towards the end of the cut, it literally kind of exploded and the off fall piece looked very much like the runner to a dog sled. Mm -hmm. And uh, I show that to every one of my classes when we're first talking about the table saw. And if kids are wondering about what's reactive wood or you want to make that point, uh, you know, when, when either I or students are cutting a longer piece of wood, the student standing there, I just say, hey, watch, watch that saw curve, that gap. Right. And you, you can see it open and close throughout the cut. Okay, we're going to move on. Okay, the jointer. Um, they must use these when they're using the jointer. This is a, a push stick that I think I got from um, Woodworkers in New Mexico, that New Mexico place. Um, these are really fabulous. I use them on, on the saws. I use them on the saws. I still use them on, on saws I have at home. Um, this is a wooden push, push stick. This is a hold down and this is the push block. So that, and, and on the bottom of the push block, I glue a piece of 80 grit sandpaper to help it to, uh, to hold the wood. Um, the inf information is again on the machine about the limitations and sizes and up on the top of the fence as well. So footprint. Most of the machines or the major machines um, that require a position, I would paint a footprint. I painted a footprint on the floor as to where the foot or feet should be when operating that machine to maintain proper balance and maintain clearance. And so the jointer had this one right here where they would put the left foot. Um, jointer techniques, um, if it's a short piece of stock, both hands on the push block, long stock, um, one hand on the push block, the other hand on the hold down, not on the board. And this is an example of the machine that has the dust collector switch attached to it right there handy to, to turn the machine on. Drill press. Okay, drill presses are not usually thought of as being very hazardous, but sometimes things can start spinning around. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. And one of the main things that I became aware of is do not keep a keychain, a chuck key on a chain uh, or a cable to keep it handy. You'll notice that right here the, the chuck key is um, on the table here. Also, this one has a spring-loaded push-out, so it can't stay in the the, um, uh, the in the in the chuck on the on the drill press. Because one things that can happen, um, better to lose it than buy an, and buy another. Because uh, the the incident that I was aware of is that a student was tightening the chuck, 
It was on a chain. Another student thought he'd be funny and start the drill press, and it ended up spinning around and cutting his finger off. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't see that. It was just told to me, but it makes a lot of sense. It could be a potential finger amputation. So be very aware, wary of um, those kinds of things on the drill press. This is my bandsaw. This is the, not my bandsaw. This is Campolindo's bandsaw. I replaced an old uh, Powermatic, I think it was. And this is a fabulous saw. Um, it has um, ceramic blocks for blade guides, and they're great. Seems harmless. The bandsaw is, you know, quieter than a table saw. It's much more easily, um, to re much more easy to relax using. However, uh, it can be obviously hazardous, and to drive that point home, I would take chicken thigh bones, uh, show them how closely it resembles a finger, and then just really easily cut through it on the bandsaw as a good demonstration. And uh, the height above the blade, obviously, is above the uh, the work is obviously critical. No need to have a bunch of ex of um, exposed blade. And some people do an extended blade guard like this. I didn't especially find that necessary because it's hard to get your finger down in there like that anyway. Um, the table saw. Of course, this one here, this is the old unisaw. Notice the blade guard up here. This is a Beesmeyer blade guard. I really like those. I'll talk about that a bit later. How can I injure thee? Let me count the ways. Concussion, get a kickback. Impalement, kickback. I knew a woman who was impaled on a kickback. Um, and number three, lacerations, amputations. So they must use push sticks. And here's that, um, that plastic one again. Um, two different styles of push sticks. And I'll show you when I talk about technique that I would have the students use um, two push sticks. Anyway, we need to move on because we're running out of time here. So uh, let's get through this one. Here's a Beast Meyer splitter. Notice the foot push sticks are colored. I had different colors for each saw and machine that uses them so that they wouldn't get, they wouldn't wander away to another machine. This is the best one. The best anti-kickback device is the riving knife that comes with the saw stop. After I got saw stops, it eliminated kickbacks entirely. Saw stop is obviously the best one for a school shop. And there's the saw stop with the uh, gesson fence on it. This was a main this is the main tool that we use in here. This is the, Beast, this is the uh, saw stop uh, blade guard. I never liked it. I kept the um, Beesmeyer ones and used those instead. Okay, so this one here I'm not going to do because it's not something that I did. Somebody else gave me that information. Here are the placement uh, footprints painted on the floor of the stop. It keeps the operator out of the line of a kickback and uh, in a properly balanced position. Uh, comfortable natural position to operate the saw. Left knee aligned with the paddle um, on off panel so that if you had to stop the machine you could just hit it with your leg. One of the nice things about the saw stop. Okay so here is a student doing a cross cut on a five inch wide panel using the fence. So, as you saw there, uh, inappropriate use of the fence with a five inch wide piece of wood. It started to rise up and it ended up getting caught on the back edge of the blade and thrown backwards. It hit his pocket, destroyed his cell phone, went to the off back end of the shop, bounced off a, a piece of machinery there and ended up on the floor in front of the saw that he was operating. So uh, that's, that's gonna be a problem. Why was that recorded? I had a student going around taking video of people working. You just happen to catch that one. Now, the safety manual, this is the format. Um, we've only got five minutes left here. Uh, photo and description of the machines, the hazards of the machine, how to mitigate those hazards, the safety rules for each individual machine, and the first seven rules are all the same for each machine, a glossary and the test. 
And one final caveat here, students will do what they see you do even if they've been told not to, and they learn by observation. Take no shortcuts even if you do it safely, not in front of students. Now QR codes, um, most of you should be familiar with QR, QR codes by now. <clears throat> They're very handy. Um, this is a link to the, I'm gonna give you this in the um, chat area. These are three links. QR codes for the videos and uh, a link to my safety videos. And this one here is a Dropbox link where you can get my safety manual. It's okay. a bit large as a, for a, uh, an email. So I will put that in the, in the chat as a, a Word document, if I can. Um, the QR codes, so let me, let me start with here. These are, these are videos <coughs> that, I had, that I made with a friend on how to operate the various machines. All of the machines that were in the shop are here. And so, um, those are accessible on here. They are also, um, well, you can, I also put a, a QR code that was associated with each of those videos on the machines that they pertain to. So mm -hmm. a student could um, see those videos uh, if he needed a refresher or if I thought he needed a refresher. So they were right there accessible. They could look at that thing, use, a, use their phone to uh, access that video and then uh, look at the, uh, the lesson. This is the one that has the, um, the safety manual. And this here has the actual QR codes that, that are attached to each of the videos. So um, I will put that on there if I can. And uh, let's see, what else do we have here? That looks like it was, uh, Don, can I ask you a quick question? Please. How do you handle cell phones in your wood shop? Are they allowed to have them? Uh, no. Um, some people, what I did is I actually told them, put your phones away. If I see you using it, it's going to go in the box up here at the front of the room, and you're going to have to get it from the office, and it's going to have to be your parent that picks it up. Okay. So that's what I would do. Um, yeah. So some people just take them as they come into the room. Okay. So, um, you know, it's up to you. It also depends on what your, what your, um, your district's um, policies are. I don't allow them, but then having the QR code on the machine, then they have to pull out their phone. Right. That's exactly why I let them keep them. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tough issue. It really is. I mean, even some parents say, well, what if I have to contact my student? Well, you don't have yeah, to do it in no. class. Well, just, I, I try to explain that we're also getting you ready for industry and most companies do not allow you to be on your phone. Um, my daughter has a summer job at FedEx and the first thing she told me is, mom, I can't have my phone. So if you text me, I can't answer you probably for a few hours. I'm like, well, that's fine. If it's a real emergency, I can find you. Right, exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, we got time for a few questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to put this in that chat if I can. So hang on a second while I try to figure out how to do that. Just copy and paste. You can do it. Okay. Uh, but I need to get at it. So um, give me a minute. Be my comment. <laughs> hang on. You gotta get rid of everything here. Chat pops up at the bottom when you bring your cursor down to the bottom of the Zoom screen. I, I do know that. Yep. Okay, get everybody back here. I seem to have, where is everybody? John. Oh, 
these videos will be um, available. Okay. Probably towards the end of the week. All right. So let me try to paste this. Okay, well, that's not all of it. Well, okay, so here's the deal. I'll send you this stuff if you, if you send me an email. I'll make <laughs> okay. it easy for you. Okay, just right. send me an email and I'll get that to you. All right. Um, you will, Trent, yes. you will have to talk to Rob about that. Uh, the rest of us are just supposed to send our recordings to him at the end of every day and he's gonna compile them and figure out how to distribute them to everybody. Okay, well, everything is on here, actually, where I put, I pasted it on the chat. So if those, those, um, those should be active links. Yeah, no. there it is, give it a try. All right, anything else? So we're send, are we sending you our email? No, if you want to, yes, but uh, if you have other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay, no, for the, for the, the other links, um, no, it should be in chat. I, I, as you suggested, I copied and pasted it. Mine hasn't updated yet. I've not okay. seen it on mine yet. You haven't. Hit send. Oh, hang on. Did you hit enter after you put it yeah. in? And... Doesn't seem to be any place to hit enter. Hit return. I tried that. It goes clunk clunk. Just hit the enter key. Yeah, that's what I get. Can you hear that? Yeah, I, I can hear it. Use a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> the bigger hammer. Bigger hammer. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on. Um, it says here to everyone, and I pasted it, and um, then it's not there. Don, to go kind of go around, circumvent the emailing everybody individually, do you want to email the links to me quickly? And I'll see if I can. Would you like to email those three links to me quickly, and then I can put them in the, or I can try to put them in the chat for everybody. Okay, hold on. I don't know if people are interested in that. I certainly am. It could, it could probably save you multiple emails, Tom. Right. The last chat that I'm showing is from Tim, and it is some email address for YouTube but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, those are the, uh, I just, I took the link that he put up on the screen and I just put it into the uh, into the browser and that's what pops up. So it's just a YouTube channel with every video that he's done. So it's got like table saw, miter saw, joiner, band saw. So it's just, it's just his YouTube channel basically. Okay. Yeah, so click on that link, it'll take you to YouTube and I'm assuming all the videos are on there. Okay, Trent, I'm just sending that to you right now in, a, in an email. Okay, thanks, Don. <sighs> Heard that. on my school email or my personal email? I think it was um, a, a Gmail. Okay, perfect. So am I supposed to be doing that in the little box at the bottom? Yes. That, yeah. That's chat, yes. Yeah, that's what I did. It, it comes up usually in, you can specify, but the default is it says to everyone. And that's what it says there. And then I put it there, pasted it there. And I thought that's all it would take. But then, ah, there it goes. There it is. 
Oh. I entry, enter, and then it came in. Okay, so you've got, um, it looks as though the QR codes did not make it. It was a, actually a, a copy of a Word document. Okay, well, if it's not um, uploaded to the internet anywhere, it won't paste. Okay. So you guys may have to email Don about the QR codes. I'm interested in getting those, those QR codes that you can put on machines that relate to the videos. Send me an email. D-A-D at iCloud.com. Thanks, Don. Great information. Thanks, Don. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Grant, for your help. My pleasure. Okay, I'm signing off. Have a good day. You. Okay, I am going to have to end this and start another meeting. So I will see you all later. Thank you.